Let us pray. Father God, we gather here on this your holy day to worship you. Please remove from our minds triviality and any distractions and give us a clear picture of who you are during this service. Please allow the Holy Spirit to fill this sanctuary and each one of us so that our thoughts, our words, our actions, our music will be pleasing to you. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning to each of you and happy Sabbath. We're glad that you are here. Uh, many of our young children are down the road at SLA for Children's Church. And I think there's remix this Sabbath as well. So we're few in numbers, but we're strong in spirit. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, we want to give a special welcome, especially to our visitors. If you are visiting with us, we're glad that you are here. We have a special meal prepared for you at Potluck today, right after the service. So just make your way downstairs to the fellowship hall and join us for a meal. <clears throat> you know, yesterday was the official start of spring. Um, but in typical New England fashion, uh, winter is saying, no, not yet, not yet. And that's okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. If it, if it snowed like this in January or February, I'd be okay with that. <laughs> right? But it didn't. You know, on, on a more somber note, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, many of you know that last week, Friday and Saturday, um, on the Pacific Archipelago, uh, archipelago, rather, nation of Vanuatu, uh, Cyclone Pam was sustained winds of 170 to 180 miles per hour, blasted many of the islands, leaving massive destruction in its path. Um, and I read online that a major challenge for this nation was its geography, because you see it's made up of over 80 islands and communication between the islands has been severely hampered. Uh, they expect the death toll to rise as, they, uh, as the numbers come in, as the days and the weeks pass by. And humanitarian aid is coming in, but as expected, it's been slow because they don't have large runways for airplanes. Uh, large ships that arrive must eventually disperse their supplies to many different islands. Um, I was reading online at the ADRA website that more than 100,000 people are homeless and a health crisis is looming. But according to the president of ADRA, he said that the people of Vanuatu uh, need more than just our financial support. They need our prayers. So ADRA has asked that today, March 21st, be a day of prayer for the people of Vanuatu. Uh, Jonathan Duffy, the, the ADRA international president, states on the website that not everyone has the ability to give financially, but we can all pray. Prayer costs nothing, but the impact that it has is beyond measure. It is something we can all do this Sabbath to support the people of Vanuatu. So the church leaders and ADRA supporters and church memberships across the globe will join together today in prayer as part of this global initiative. Um, the agency is encouraging those who are wanting to be involved to uh, connect with them through their local ADRA office's Facebook page. So this morning, later on during our morning prayer, I will certainly bring that to the Lord. And I encourage you to, to do the same during the week. So, you know, even though we've been hit hard this winter, um, and many of us have complained about it, including myself, weather-wise, we have little, if anything, to complain about. Uh, I want you now to turn with me in your hymnals, to the back of your hymnals, to number 771, as we read together the call to worship. 771, Living Bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never be hungry, and whoever believes in me shall never be thirsty. But you, as I said, do not believe, although you have seen. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the man who comes to me I will never turn away. 
I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. It is his will that I should not lose even one of all he has given me, but raise them all up on the last day. For it is my Father's will that everyone who looks upon the Son and puts his faith in him shall possess eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. In truth, in very truth I tell you, the believer possesses eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, and they are dead. I am speaking of the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and never die. I am that living bread which has come down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he shall live forever. Moreover, the bread which I will give is my own flesh. I give it for the life of the world. This led to a fierce dispute among the Jews. How can this man give us flesh to eat, they said. Jesus replied, In truth, in very truth I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you can have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood possesses eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. My flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells continually in me, and I dwell in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me shall live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, and it is not like the bread which our fathers ate. They are dead, but whoever eats this bread shall live. seated. This is a great shovel. If you look at the tips of it, it's starting to get dented a little bit in places where I've gotten a little too vigorous in my shoveling. But I've had this for a while and I thought somewhere in mid-January that I wasn't going to have much of a reason to use it this year. And then that last week of January and about five weeks of straight, seemingly unending snowfalls gave me a lot of chance. In fact, I think I've seen more of this than I have my family at times. It just, we spent a lot of time together and 
as I shoveled the walks and I shoveled the driveway and thought this is getting kind of hard to throw over the mounds of snow that are building up. All of a sudden I started reading and just it hadn't crossed my mind I'd been shoveling so much. I started reading about something I didn't hear a lot about called ice dams and I thought you know what I should probably get on the roof and shovel the roof off too. And so I got up there and I should have done it earlier because between my neighbor's roof rake and my shovel and my son up there with a the shovel too and before you get too much about calling DSS or DCF on me I promise you he was safe at all times. I maybe wasn't but he was. It took approximately six to seven hours to get the roof cleared off. And then I started thinking you know what there's probably other people who need help too. And the heights don't really bother me with that. I'm not going to lie to you, there's a couple times where I started to slip and as I was slipping thinking this could get interesting. And I may not have exactly said it like that but that's what I was thinking. <laughs> and so when I went to help out some other people, there's one particular church member I showed up to shovel off the roof for. And as I got on the roof and started shoveling, I looked at the roof and thought, it took me six to seven hours with help on mine. What well, makes me think I'm going to do this any quicker here? And then out of, all of a sudden, who should show up but another church member with a shovel? And you know what? We got done in pretty rapid order. Then after that place, we went to somebody else's house and took care of their deck and worked on the driveway. And after that, we both collapsed in our trucks and attempted to drive a straight line back to where we lived because we were both tired. And this morning when I looked outside and I saw it snowing, I looked at my shovel and said, no. It's March 21st. I'm sorry, your time has come and gone. I'm going to use you as a prop this morning. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to take you home. I'm going to put you in the shed. And until sometime next November, December, we will remain apart. I understand absence makes the heart go fonder, and I want to prove it. <laughs> and so, yes, this is a prop today, because even though it's snowing out there, you can go home and shovel if you want. I'm not going to. Finances never stop, and you always have to have your financial shovel. When I opened up, actually, when Deborah confronted me, and I use that word specifically, confronted me with our latest electric bill, she said, look at this. I would love to tell you that I reacted with Christ-like attitude when I saw it, but I can promise you that after the inhaling and the exhaling that took place at the size of the bill, I thought to myself, oh my, what in the world? Look at the size of this. And I'm sure some of you had that reaction when you got yours recently, thanks to the 37% hike and the cold weather and et cetera, et cetera. The finances never stop at home. After we take care of that, something else will come up. Now, if you figured out a way to stop the finances at your house, I would love to have you start a special small group here at our church and school us on how to make sure that the financial obligations stop. But they don't, they don't stop for our church either. So I would encourage you, even if you're putting away your snow shovels, to keep your financial shovels out because, well, the budget never goes away. And it has not been healthy for a while. And I can promise you that the financial committee and the church board constantly have to look at it. And at some point, when you keep being in a situation that we're in, things have to change. And that's never easy. Any of us who have gone through, my household included, where your finances have changed, and now all of a sudden you have to look and go, ooh, what do we have to do without? It's never easy. But it's a reality. Would that we were the government and could just keep adding zeros to the end of our budget, no big deal, but we're not. So I encourage you. I don't anticipate any of you right now are whipping out your checkbooks or grabbing for the extra money, but I encourage you, just like we're going to pray for the people of, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, and we're going to pray for all the other places that have seen devastation, I'd encourage you as a household, whether you're singular, plural, how many people are in there, to prayerfully consider what more can we potentially do to make sure that our church is where it should be and that financially we are solid. Because while we're going to get relief from winter here very shortly, we know where we live and November will come again. So please prayerfully consider this as the deacons take up our offering.
Dear Lord, the phone calls, the letters, the requests for money never stop. Lord, as we consider our finances, help us to be fiscally prudent in our homes and also in your home. As we reconsider this week and beyond, help us, Lord, each and every one to prayerfully, thoughtfully, and actively put your finances at the forefront of our thoughts. We pray in your name. Amen. Before the children come forward, I just want to have everybody go to your bulletins and take out the second bulletin. It looks like the second bulletin out of your bulletin. This is our Grow Group for initiative for spring 2015. And I'm going to talk about this for a little bit, and I'm going to talk about it next week, because some of you need to hear it from up here to, to know that it's happening. And I just want to make sure you do know it's happening. And I want, to, I want you to look very deep within your heart and find that little prick and nurture it, because that is something that's important. I think that we really need to take initiative and really invest in each other, invest in community. And this is a way of doing it. This is meant for our church, but it's also meant for our community. But first and foremost, it's meant for us to connect with each other, to break down um, any kind of clique, any kind of stereotype, any kind of uh, segregation that we have within our church. Because as a visioning committee, when we were looking at some of the issues of our church, that was one of the main things that came through, is that we're very fractured, and we need healing. We need healing within. So I'm going to read through the list of these grow groups, just so that you've heard it up here. We have basic auto mechanics, making the most of your smartphone, pray, love, eat, chalk painting, songwriting, classroom topics and integrating technology, soap making, origami, $2 Tuesday bowling, artisan bread making, girls night out, and gardening. Now, you might not be interested in any of those, but you might after you get to know a little bit more about it. So I just challenge you to step out of your comfort zone, try something you haven't done before, and get involved. All right, the children can come forward at this time. You guys are still pretty cute. You did a good job picking up all of that money. I know all the little kids get the credit, but you're still cute, right? Yeah, OK. So um, I have a little uh, quiz for you today. We're going to talk about symbols. OK, what's a symbol? Something that gives meaning to something, something that stands for something. OK, what is this a symbol of? McDonald's, really unhealthy food. Sorry if you like McDonald's. OK. What is this a symbol of? The best baseball team ever. What's this a symbol of? Love. Not a heart. It is a heart. It's a symbol of love, yes. What about this? Nike, the Nike swoosh. What about this? The Olympics. You guys are so smart. I think you're doing better than the little kids would have done. What about this? 
the Bruins, that's right. What about this? Right, okay, the sacrifice of God on the cross. It was, you were like, is this a trick question? <laughs> what about this? What is this symbol of? Yeah, no more floods. It's God's promise. Okay, doing awesome. What about this one? The best football team ever. All right, so those are all symbols, and when we see them, we immediately think of something, right? We do. We immediately think of something. And I, today we're, we're celebrating communion, and I've been asking myself all week, why do we do communion? Because God had a lot of symbols in the Old Testament, but then he took a lot of them away, and we didn't need them anymore. But he left this one. This one is an important one, and he left it for us. And it is a symbol. It is a symbol of something. What is the bread a symbol of? His body. What is the wine a symbol of? His blood, right? And I think that it's just really important that we remember that God died for us and that he saved us. And in partaking of his grace, of his body and his blood, we are saved. And so that's what we're doing today. And I was thinking all week, why is this so important? And I think it's just the most important thing we have as Christians is that we are saved by Jesus and he died for us. So I don't want you guys to forget that. And I want you to think about that while you're taking communion. All right, you can go back to your seats. Thank you. At this time of prayer, I invite you to stand with me as we sing our prayer song, Marching to Zion, in just the first stanza. We don't sing the chorus, but uh, stand with me as we sing Marching to Zion and join me up front for prayer if you'd like. possible, I invite you to kneel with me. O Lord God in heaven, we come to you on this, your holy day, the Sabbath, to enjoy fellowshipping together with one another, with like believers and fellow minds, but more importantly, Lord, to give you honor and glory and praise. You deserve all of it and more. And so we ask that during our time together today, especially during this special service, that our, our minds and our focus will be on you and that it will be pleasing to you. I pray, Lord, in a special way for those that are suffering on the islands of Vanuatu, and the devastation that they are experiencing and going through, perhaps looking for loved ones that are missing, finding out where their next meal or something clean to drink is going to come from. Lord, we lift them up to you collectively, not only here at College Church, but throughout our worldwide church, and just ask that you will surround them with love, with aid, and show them your mercy and your grace. We have, we're about to start here at College Church our grow groups. As Pastor Heather just mentioned, some of them um, look pretty exciting and, and maybe something we want to learn more about. But we also look forward to fellowshipping with one another and getting to know each other better. May that come out of our grow groups as well. Lord, as I was driving to church this morning, many of us were, there's a man across the street holding a sign. I'm not sure what his story is, and I'm not sure even what his name is, but you know him. You know the pain or the, the tough times that he's gone through. Maybe something was said to him that has hurt him or upset him. But I reach out to him, and we do as a church, just to ask that you'll be with him. Help us to reach out to him. 
May we as a church not be so inward focused, Lord. Starting with me, may we look outward. May we find ways to reach out to others, to involve them, to love them as you do with us. In a special way, I ask as the church is getting closer to bringing on our next senior pastor, I pray for that continued search, that continued movement. And in a special way, Lord, I pray that this person that that we find next as our senior pastor will be our last senior pastor. How wonderful would it be if, in fact, if we don't even, you don't even have to wait, Lord, that long. If you want to come sooner than that, that's okay with us. For we're tired of this earth and the devastation and the hurt and the pain that happens to us day to day. Some folks have come forward for special prayer, and I pause at this time to let them bring their praise or concerns to you. We have a prayer book in our foyer. I lift those names up to you now and add to those names Elaine and Charles and Jim and Eugene and Benjamin and Henry for health concerns. And I also add for, for protection upon Stephen and Joshua and Jonathan. Lord, thank you for South Lancaster Academy and Browning and Atlantic Union College, our our schools right down the street from us. I ask that you will continue to bless them, bless their efforts, especially with SLA and Browning as they're about to embark on a major campaign here soon. May your will be done in the lives of those people as well, including this church. In just a little while, Lord, we're going to focus our attention on you with the ceremony of the Lord's Supper. Clean our hearts. Forgive us of our sins. Take away the guilt and the shame that we might have, the things that we've done to hurt you or other people. And close us, clothe us rather, with your righteousness, Lord. Cleanse us from within. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
And our living word passage of the day is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, for which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Hey, Amanda, will you wash my feet for me? Sure, Dill. But don't you think these crackers taste so good? I've already had five. Um, Jill, I don't think that the crackers are for filling your belly. Uh, what else would you do with them? Well, the Bible says that eating, cracker, eating the crackers and drinking the juice is to proclaim Jesus' death and look forward to his resur resurrection. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, then isn't it better if I have more because I'm proclaiming more? No, because the Bible also says that eating and drinking the blood and body of Christ in an unworthy manner is guilty of sinning, so eating too much isn't good. Then how do I eat and drink? You have to look inside yourself and see if you're worthy first. But what if you are unworthy and you eat and drink? So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone who ought to examine themselves before they eat and the bread and drink from the cup. Then you're eating and drinking for yourself, not God. Okay, so I have to find myself worthy and also hope for his return to be worthy then. Yep, that's pretty much it. Wow, I thought the church always did it to give out free food. Well, now you know. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. May Christ speak to each of us from this his word today. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Let's begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we are here today and thank you that we're here in the grace of God. And Lord, please be with us as we focus ourselves a little bit on your sacrifice and on each other and what it means to be Christians. We love you in your name, amen. I remember my parents were of the disposition that you should wait until you were baptized to take part in communion. Of course, this is not actually um, a church-held view. It was more of a personal opinion. In fact, as a church, we hold an open communion, which means that anybody can participate in communion. But I think they wanted me to experience the specialness of it, kind of like waiting with the anticipation for the day that you can finally drive the car when you turn 16. And I remember that anticipation. I remember watching as the plate would pass right at eye level. They always went right at eye level, right by me. And I remember watching and everybody would take a piece of that dark, fragrant bread, you could smell it, and everybody would take some of that deep, rich, purple grape juice. I love grape juice. And I remember just sitting there in silence and you'd hear everybody start chewing and your mouth would start watering, and you really, really wanted to have a piece of the communion bread. And, and actually, I remember my mom sometimes, when my dad wasn't looking, would slip me a piece. She'd break off a piece of hers and hand it to me, and I would have to pretend like I really wasn't chewing the bread because my dad was very strong on this. You wait until you're baptized. And I just remember that kind of anticipation and the excitement and I just wanted to taste it. I wanted to experience the experience. What was it all about? You know, I've since lost some of that wonder. And I'm sad about that. And I've spent most of this week trying to ask myself, why? Why communion? Why do we do this? What is the significance? Why is it important of all the symbols that God created to show himself to the children of Israel and to point forward and, and, and of all the things that we don't do traditionally as, as, as Protestant churches, why do we still take communion? And why did he choose this as a remaining way of showing himself? And I, I started to explore 1 Corinthians chapter 11 
Let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I found the answer. Communion is really a fourfold reminder. It's a motivator. It's meant to center us in tangible, hands-on, physical way on, on four things. We find in chapter 11, verse 26, that every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Communion is meant to show us Christ, to remind us of Christ. We first look back at the cross. When we take the bread, we hold the representation of God's blood and body. And we celebrate the atonement of our sins, its inclusiveness, its grace. It's easy to love the unlovable, but it's hard to love the unlovely. Yet God said in Romans that even while we were still sinners, he died for us. And we remember that he died for us. Because if he has not died for us, we cannot be here. Secondly, communion is meant to have us look within. In verse 28, it says, A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks of the cup. What has the above grace done to change our lives? How do we represent the sacrifice that God has given us? How has it changed us? If we are not being transformed by the sacrifice, then maybe we are not understanding its power clearly. We need to look within. How does the grace that he has given me, his body, his blood, changed me? Thirdly, it's meant to show us each other. Earlier in 1 Corinthians 10, 17, it says, because there's one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. We need each other. We need to serve each other, not as a benefit to others, but as a benefit to ourselves. So much of the time we look at service as something that we are doing for others. But service is meant to be done so that we can grow and we can learn and we can benefit from the value of service. We are meant to look at others. We are looking at the example of Christ when he made himself lowly and washed the feet of his servants or his, his disciples as a servant would. That's what we are doing when we participate in the service, reminding ourselves that we have the blessing of serving each other in community. And it is also, lastly, meant to give us hope for the future. It says that we do this until he comes. Because when he comes, we will not need to do it anymore to remind ourselves. We will do it as a celebration with him. It is a tangible partici participation that we believe in Christ, the one who died and rose again and is coming soon to take us home, and I cannot wait for that day. So today, as we partake in this service, let us remember Christ who died, the responsibility of what that grace does, the transforming act of serving others, and the hope that someday we will touch the man whose body saved us. It is now time for us to break up into our foot washing service. You're welcome to participate. Just a few technicalities. We have the women in the youth chapel, the men in the juniors room, and the families can participate downstairs in the fellowship hall. We encourage you to participate, but when you come back in, I just want to remind you of a couple things. Please do not sit on a row that has a reserved sign on it and do not sit in the balcony because we don't have deacons to go up into the balcony. So if you're in the balcony, please come down and sit every other row. Um, when you come back in, there will be some music playing and please come in quietly. We want to reflect on this time um, and this worship of Christ. Thank you.
Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this symbol of you. Be with us now in your name. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, just as the children of Israel in the preparation for leaving Egypt made bread without yeast, so is your body without sin. And as we partake of the bread right now, we reflect upon that sacrifice that you made for us so long ago so that we can be with you forever. We thank you for that. In your name we pray, amen. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in remembrance of Christ who died on the cross, we partake of this wine. Please help us to show an offering with our hearts and our lives. Help us to be committed to live for him who died for us. Amen. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your sacrifice. Thank you for your grace. And may we take that, and may we live it, and may it transform us. We love you in your name. Amen.
as you exit the building, there are offering plates available. This traditionally has been our love offering. It is an offering that we make that is special for anybody who is in need in our community or is in need of aid. We use that specifically for our community, and that is our love offering. Thank you for coming. May God bless you.